thank you, Gaber, for that kind introduction. It's, it's great to be back here in uh, Budapest uh, for the second conference, bookending the First World War. I was also here for the conference on the occasion of the war's outbreak. Um, now, John Maynard Keynes once said that uh, most politicians, whether or not they know it, are acting out either the, the views or the fantasies of some dead, defunct economist. Uh, one might say the same thing about historians, that is to say that politicians uh, tend to operate based on assumptions about history. Uh, nowhere, I think, was this more apparent than um, in France recently, where uh, President Macron uh, gave his uh, considered historical opinion uh, by way of rebuking uh, U.S. President Donald Trump about nationalism, that in fact the First World War was apparently about excessive nationalism and, and the solution to this problem apparently was <clears throat> either supranationalism or something uh, akin to the European Union. This has become kind of a cliche now. You might almost call it the European Union understanding of the First World War. That is, that the First World War was caused by an excess of patriotic nationalist feeling, and the solution to this, of course, is to suppress that type of feeling. Um, this is, to put it mildly, a strange reading of the history of the First World War. Uh, not merely in that the war was, of course, born far more out of imperial rivalry, particularly between countries like the multi-ethnic Habsburg Empire and the multi-ethnic Romanov or Rom Russian Empire in the Balkans, the Near East, the Ottomans, the Italians. So the war's origins cannot really be explained in terms of nationalism, but it's perverse even in the more literal sense that if you look at the European Union today, it it has sometimes been described as something akin to a German-dominated European customs union. Well, that was, in fact, one of Imperial Germany's stated war aims in 1914, according to the September program, the notorious September program of bethmann hollweg That is, that Germany was actually fighting to create a German-dominated European customs union. So the European Union can hardly be the solution to the problem of the First World War if, in fact, one of Germany's aims in fighting the First World War was to create something akin to the European Union. Um, so that doesn't make a lot of sense. I, I think part of what goes on in the background when people like Macron start to abuse history is that some of it is, I think, a narrowness of vision. If you do look at the First World War from the perspective of modern-day France, perhaps Belgium, maybe even parts of Western Germany, you might say, well, look, what was that all about after all? The borders are more or less what they were then. The countries still look more or less like they did on the map then, perhaps with the exception of Alsace-Lorraine. Um, so the war seemed to be about really nothing at all. It was just this, this aberration, this temporary madness that overcame the peoples of Europe. But of course it looks very different in the East. Um, if I can get this map to work here. It looks very different in the Ottoman Empire, in the Balkans. It looks very different in this area right here. It looks very different uh, going a little further east in the Ottoman Empire or, of course, right here in the conflict zone in Eastern Europe. Here, of course, you had uh, a mosaic, a blend of ethnic peoples, a blend of religions of, of many faiths all colliding, and essentially you had uh, zones of what you might call imperial contestation. And at the end of the war, of course, in 1918, what you essentially had was the dissolution of empire. Um, so that oddly enough, again, to, to abuse Macron just a little bit further, um, his idea that nationalism caused the First World War and that somehow by eradicating nationalism you could solve the problems of the First World War, what's quite strange about that, I mean, it's even more than ironic, it's almost kind of the reversal of the truth, is that the, the attempted solution of these problems, of course, was to replace multi-ethnic empires with nation states. And in fact, that was the vision of none other than the US president at the time, Woodrow Wilson. It, it didn't always work, and obviously it was applied inconsistently with, with often deleterious consequences. But in fact, when you look at 1918 and the way people try to solve these problems in Eastern Europe, they saw nationalism or some variety of the nation state as actually the solution to the problems caused by the First World War. It's curious that even the Germans had this vision. You, you can get a little bit of a taste on this map here for uh, what, what was going on in the Eastern Front in 1918. You can see some of the movements of the German armies that in fact by, by spring of 1918 they had essentially made it as far here as uh, virtually to the dawn. In fact, uh, the Germans had even sent scouting parties as far as Tseritzen on the Volga. Uh, this vision of uh, what, of course, Hitler later fantasized as Lebensraum in the East, um, it might seem kind of nefarious. On the other hand, the Germans, 
perhaps in response to Woodrow Wilson's own rhetoric about this idea of self-determination, the Germans actually proposed something relatively similar in 1918 to the problem of what to do with the former lands of the Russian Empire. In fact, they proposed a map that doesn't look that different from the world that we have today, including some of the independent Baltic states and independent Ukraine, with which, of course, Germany signed a peace treaty before actually the Bolsheviks agreed to sign. That was back in February of 1918. They essentially saw the solution to the problems of, of essentially security, imperial rivalry, the collapse of authority, the dissolution of borders and so on in the East as being one of creating nation states. Um, and that is of course exactly what the Western allies later decided to do, uh, somewhat against their will because they too were trying to essentially placate, you might say, Woodrow Wilson in his vision of self-determination. So, so the British and French had to play this new game in the former Ottoman sphere of essentially pretending, you might say, um, it's another map, I'm trying to find the map of, uh, there we go, pretending essentially that they were not playing the game of empire, they were not in fact trying to expand their zones of imperial contestation, but particularly in the British case, essentially inventing the concept of, of Arab nationalism while simultaneously embracing Zionism, that is seeing, seeing some version of ethnic nationalism as a solution to the problems of the Ottoman Empire. Now the irony there, of course, was that in some ways the real beneficiary, as, as actually we, we've been hearing from some of the other speakers, was Mustafa Kemal, who turned out to have a far more coherent version of nationalism than some of those, those other less successful groups. Uh, the Armenians did eventually get a nation, but of course they had to wait until almost the end of the 20th century to get it. Uh, the Kurds are still sort of waiting for a nation today. Um, but in the case of Turkey, it's really quite remarkable that Mustafa Kemal saw the solution essentially to this problem of the instability and the constant contestation over um, the carcass, if you will, of the Ottoman Empire. He saw the solution as being creating something like a, a solid relatively mono-ethnic state with a cohesive national identity. Yes, with several large minorities, particularly Kurds, but essentially the idea was to replace what had been a multi-ethnic empire, the Ottoman Empire, which really had been the cause of conflicts going back centuries, particularly over the decades before the First World War. I mean, there, there's a very real sense, as I've argued in some of my books, that you could actually interpret the entire First World War as something like a war of the Ottoman succession. If you're looking at its outbreak in the Balkans, if you're looking at its, its chaotic and messy resolution and lack of resolution in 1918, uh, along with the series of wars that, of course, followed, uh, the armistice which supposedly ended the war to end all war in 1918, you could see uh, Turkish nationalism as in fact one of the most elegant and lasting solutions to these various problems. To some extent, the Turks of course had learned, you might say, their nationalism from some of their ethnic rivals, some of the Christian minority peoples of the Ottoman Empire and of the Balkan states. But they actually saw at the end of the war this type of nation state is again a, a more sensible solution to the problem. To give you an idea of what Kemal was actually to some extent arguing against, um, you can't actually see it on this map. I have to keep finding the right map. Um, this one will work. Okay, so now if we have, you could actually see on this map Mashash Kala. This is a little known fact in the end, the, uh, the actual end of the First World War. Some of it actually did not end on Armistice Day. In fact, uh, right after Armistice Day, after actually a separate armistice was signed between the Ottoman Empire and Britain at Mudros on the 30th and 31st of October, there was actually an Ottoman army at Machashkala, essentially in what is now modern Dagestan. The, the Ottomans had actually taken Baku. This was actually a different vision, you might say, a little bit like the Germans had that vision of the German-dominated customs union of Mitteloy Europa. The Romantics in the Ottoman camp, and particularly Enver Pasha, had this vision sometimes called Panterranianism, that is, of a, of a kind of grand Ottoman Empire perhaps linking up with the Turkic peoples of Central Asia and Baku, and then eventually Petrovsk or Mashashkala, there were going to be these links across the Caspian, and there was going to be this large vision of a kind of a greater empire. Uh, it's largely, in fact, because Enver pursued that vision, uh, really at the expense of common sense, that in the end he, he left the, basically the, uh, the, the approaches to the capital, uh, Istanbul or Constantinople, as it was then still called, across the Thracian plain, essentially unguarded. Um, in addition, he had actually denuded the force pool in Syria, which helped um, uh, the British General Allenby and Allenby's armies uh, to pour up through Syria in September 1918. 
It's interesting that you might say the discredited imperial vision of Enver Pasha, I mean, it was, it was exposed as, as essentially absurd when you had these Ottoman troops in Machaskala of all places when the Ottoman capital lay completely undefended. And in the end, the Ottomans, after the sanguinary struggle at the Dardanelles in Gallipoli, essentially had to let the British fleet in unmolested. So that here, as elsewhere in Eastern Europe, and particularly with regard to the German situation, you could actually see a kind of ethnic nationalism, again, as, as a solution to a wholly, in, in some ways, unnecessary conflict, or the very least, an un unnecessarily bloody and destructive conflict, which really was brought about because of imperial ambition. Um, so that I think that in Eastern Europe, and if, if we to bring, bring the, the, the map back to some of the other countries in between um, the central powers in Russia, that is the, the future nations of Eastern Europe, which are only roughly delineated on this map, although you can see some of them, places like Estonia and, and Latvia and Lithuania, and of course Finland, another country which is going to emerge from this struggle uh, in, in the course of the Russian Civil War as independent. And it was interesting that this vision really was shared by um, to some extent, the Germans, in their own attempt to redraw the map at Brest-Litovsk, in part to play to pay a kind of lip service to Wilsonian principles of self-determination. Uh, um, uh, Wilson had actually announced some of these principles shortly before they met at Brest-Litovsk in January of 1918. So the Germans, to some extent, were kind of playing the same game. Um, and the Germans, it is worth recalling, uh, ended the war in a relatively strong position in the East. I think this is another area in which the memory of the war differs so dramatically from East to West, where there was a relatively decisive, at least, victory in Western Europe, even though, of course, Allied troops had not actually entered German soil yet um, at the time the Germans sued for peace. But here, the Germans actually had a million troops occupying what had been the former Tsarist Empire. Um, in fact, the Allies even stipulated in the Compian Armistice of 11 November, the one we're essentially commemorating uh, here, they actually stipulated that they wanted Germany to maintain troops in Ukraine. There were 600,000 German troops just in Ukraine alone in 1918. They wanted German troops there. They wanted German troops in the Baltic. And in fact, German troops were, were still there, really, through most of 1918 and well into 1919, were in both Finland and also in Estonia. Uh, they actually played a relatively significant role in, in the Russian Civil War. Um, so the fact that the Germans were still there also I think gives the lie to this notion that the armistice really did wrap up the war in this kind of almost like a, a kind of a bow on a Christmas present. That is to say that the armistice really, in the way that it was commemorated, I think, recently in France, is supposed to be this moment that truly ended the conflict and truly ended this, again, this abysmal aberration of bloodletting, this uh, temporary insanity which had supposedly overcome the peoples of Western Europe. It didn't look like that in Eastern Europe. In Eastern Europe, all this was still being decided. The borders were still being decided. Poland is going to fight a series of wars, one essentially an invasion of Ukraine by invitation, uh, wars with their other neighbors, a war with the Russians, a role in the Russian Civil War. You have, of course, wars breaking out, um, as all of you know probably better than I do, in places like Hungary over contested territory with Romania, wars between Greece and Turkey. All of those conflicts, which really followed hard on the heels of the armistice, show that the First World War had not really been settled on the battlefields of Western Europe, certainly not in any definitive or lasting way. And to the extent they eventually were settled, again, they were settled by the creation of these essentially mono-ethnic states, which, for whatever reason, are, of course, out of favor today in, in respectable Western opinion, but were seen by many peoples at the time as an essential, almost a desperate solution um, essentially about kind of national survival. And of course, the peoples wouldn't necessarily be satisfied with the borders that they were given or that they did receive at the various uh, conferences and treaties. For that reason, many of them actually would fight these, these bloody wars, essentially to try to survive in this, this hostile new world, Re really created more by the disillusion of empires, that is, the disillusion of boundaries, the disillusion of imperial authority, the breakdown of law and order. To all of those problems, I think, some variety of ethnic nationalism actually came to seem like a welcome solution. Now, we all know it didn't necessarily last in the case of either the three Baltic states, in the case of 
Poland, quite famously, 1939, um, the case of Ukraine. Some of the other states of the former Soviet Union actually did have a brief kind of almost a shining dawn of independent existence as nation states between 1918 and roughly 1920 or 21, snuffed out later on by the Bolsheviks' own version of imperialism, which, which was, of course, quite ironic in that, in that the Bolsheviks and even, of all people, Stalin as nationalities commissar had initially welcomed um, the development of autonomous nationalism on the Russian periphery, but that was when they were still trying to weaken and destroy the Tsarist Empire. Uh, I think like most revolutionaries, once they were in power, they came to have very different ideas <laughs> about imperial authority. Um, this is even true in the way that they ran the army, of course, for most of 1917. The Bolsheviks were promoting mutinies in the Imperial Russian Army, and then at some point, magically, in 1918, they realized that they now controlled what was left of the Imperial Russian Army, and so they brought back military discipline, and, and they brought back the death penalty, and, and so on and so forth under Trotsky. Um, but the Bolsheviks eventually decided, of course, that they want their own version of an empire, a communist empire, a relatively expansive one, which caused uh, untold havoc in the region and eventually across the world. But it's interesting that those nation states which were briefly born in 1918, in most cases, of course, still exist today. Some of them only really allowed to um, be midwifed back into existen uh, existence by the collapse of Soviet power between 1989 and 1991, including, of course, the East European satellites, but also many of the former Soviet republics, which are now independent, including um, Ukraine, of course. So that ethnic nationalism really does not seem like either the cause of the First World War or even necessarily something we should... We should um, uh, shall I say, be concerned about uh, regarding the problems created by the First World War. Of all the untold death and destruction, of all of the lasting bitterness, of all of the, uh, the reborn rivalries between peoples that hated one another, exploited and, and to some extent then exacerbated in the Second World War, it really is a curious fact that all of those small states which tried and struggled to be born in the aftermath of the First World War Nearly all of them exist in some form today. Um, to which I think the only sensible conclusion is, is to welcome that fact and say that we should be grateful, as I think Solzhenitsyn once put it quite elegantly, that when he said that the nation states were something like God's vision of the various personalities um, you know, of, of this planet that we share, um, those nations born in 1918, they certainly did struggle and suffer and endure a great deal in the 20th century, and particularly the ones in between Germany and Russia, after, of course, Hitler and, and Stalin came on the scene, had to suffer untold uh, terror, death, and destruction in the Second World War. But somehow I think that memory, that lingering memory of, of the brief kind of heroic, exhilarating, a borning of national independence in the aftermath of the First World War lived on. And so I think that does explain something about the different political trajectories of Europe today. I think that when people think back on the 20th century, they remember different things and they learn different lessons. Again, this, what we might call the standard European Union narrative, uh, pushed by people like Macron, that is that nationalism is the problem and transnational institutions are the solution or cosmopolitanism or to some extent the eradication or the suppression of national identities or at least excessive national nationalism and patriotism is the, is the solution. It doesn't look that way in Eastern Europe. Um, in Eastern Europe when people talk about the dissolution of borders for example, I, I don't think they associate that with with Schengen and the utopia of, of free commerce and free movement of people and free movement of labor. It, I think it brings back far darker memories. Um, darker memories which I think impart to those peoples a kind of tragic vision, a, a more tragic and I think realistic sense of history and the way history transpires. That in fact, even those brief shining moments of independence and national pride should be treasured we never know how long they will last, but for that very reason, I think um, we should embrace them and, uh, and defend the identities of the various nation states. And um, I'm going to wrap things up right there.